I don't normally do this, but I'm going to start right off with uh, the title of my sermon. And the title is, Who Do You See in the Mirror? Who Do Others See? We all have mirrors in our houses, in our cars. We, we all come across mirrors in, in restrooms and public places. Uh, mirrors are all over, but I'd like you to picture one of those, I guess they call them makeup mirrors. You may see them in the, on TV or in the movies where somebody's sitting in front of it. It's got all these bright lights and they're, they're sitting there and uh, somebody's putting makeup on or plucking their eyebrows or who, who knows. It's a magnifying type of mirror. You know the type of mirror that I'm talking about. It's meant to show every square inch of your face, close up. It helps you inspect your face and then enlarges every single one of your features, both good and bad. They're lit up and pulled away from the wall. You can see absolutely everything with clarity. As your reflection stares back at you, you notice every flaw. Of course, we focus in on the flaws, right? We don't look at the, the good, concentrate on the good things that we see in the mirror necessarily, but we do look and catch all those flaws. The large pores, the crow's feet as we grow older, a few or a lot of wrinkles, parts of your beard that you miss shaving, and also those eyelashes that you, you, you missed a couple when you were plucking them out. All are amplified and lit up for you to critique. You know, it hurts sometimes to examine yourself that way and see every flaw in such clarity. Well, the thought of this, this mirror brings back to, to me and reminded me of a couple of verses in the book of James, if you would turn with me to, to there, and that's James 1. James 1. In verses 23 through 25. Here we read, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man studying his natural face in a mirror. For he studied himself and then went his way, and immediately he forgot what he was like. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, he is not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one shall be blessed in his doing. Here we read that looking in the mirror, as annoying as it can be, we can think of it, it's like studying God's word, God's Bible. When we open up our Bibles, we're staring into the character of God. And what's reflected back at us are all the ways he is perfect and that you and I are not. We see his grace and his mercy, and we are reminded that we are lacking in both. We see his power, and we realize our weaknesses. We see his faithfulness, and discover our infidelity. We see his immutability and recognize the many ways we drift and change. We see his giving nature and realize we have not always followed him in giving of ourselves nearly as much as we could. When we look into the Bible and truly study what we read, not just read the words, but truly study and meditate on their meaning and how we can apply it to our lives. God's word shows us who God is, and in turn, it shows us who we really are. It is like looking into that mirror. It's a spiritual mirror. Like looking in the physical mirror, it's not always pleasant. We don't always see what we'd like to see. when we stack ourselves up 
against our wonderful, amazing God, the creator of the universe, it's hard to feel anything other than needy and broken. Compared to him, we are all wanting. We are all falling short. We know that verse, Romans 3, verse 23. I'm sure we can all just repeat it word for word. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It's true about each one of us. None of us are perfectly following the word of God the way that Jesus did when he was on the earth. We forget what we've heard. And we casually glimpse at our perception of ourselves as we go on the way. As it says, we, take, we glance into the mirror and then we forget about it. Very quickly thereafter, we forget about how we really are, how we really act, what really makes us tick. We in our humanness can't seem to get it right all the time. I did forget to mention one thing about that mirror that shows all those flaws and all those details in our face. It also shows us what we need to fix. You might be able to pluck those extra eyebrows out that you missed the last time, or to shave that additional part of your beard that you missed, or you, you might have a, a blemish somewhere that, that needs to be cleaned. We can use that magnifying mirror and its illuminating features to help us envision our face. Well, we can do the same thing with God's word. God's word is there to magnify what we see in ourselves, what we can change, and how we are to change it. As I said, when we study, truly study the word of God, and not just read the words, which we're all guilty of at times, We know that God is there and God can help us. Without God, we couldn't do it. We look into God's character and see where we are lacking. His word magnifies it, lights it up, and shows us how to be more like him. The process, however, can often be painful, more painful than plucking those additional eyebrows or shaving those additional hairs in your beard. Sometimes we look at that spiritual mirror, and if you're like me, you say, oh, that's what I look like. And we may find it easier to leave some of those things that we see alone. We've gotten along with those imperfections all these years, and it's just too hard to change. That's, you know, that's just the way I am. It's too easy to fall into that trap. But when we look at God's word and truly study God's word, we will not, God will not allow us to have that mind frame. He will help us change our lives, change those imperfections that we have. Physically, there's our things that, about our face and about our characters that we, not our characters, but our physical bodies that we can't change as we grow older. I mean, things just, we're growing older. My knees are not like they were when I was 20 years old. I wish they were, but they're not. They remind me all the time. But with God's help, we can always, always improve our spiritual lives. We can improve our character. We can become more like him. As I said, God is not showing us who he is in the Bible so that we can stay the way we are. He wants us to change. He wants to help us change. He is showing us his light. We are looking at the mirror, yes, the mirror of God's word, and we are seeing his reflection. But not only his reflection. As time goes on, we see our reflection also as it becomes more like his. We look more like him, or we should be looking more like God every day, according to his spiritual mirror. 
God is showing us every microscopic blackhead in our character. And like one of those strips that people use to, to, to clean out their pores, um, he's pulling our flaws and our sins. He's helping us to get rid of those, to pull them out of our lives, making us less blemished every day. Jesus Christ, the Lamb, was the only truly unblemished Lamb. And the goal that we have is to be like Jesus Christ. The goal is to be unblemished. God's Word is a powerful reminder of who God is and how much He desires us to follow Him in His way. Sometimes that means taking a close-up look at not only our faces, but deep inside of us with his mirror, the Bible, his word, into our hearts, deep inside to our core, and choosing to do in what we are willing to give up. Yes, we need to do both. We need to do more. We need to be willing to do more, and we need to be able to give up of ourselves and those blemishes that we have that we have become just one with those blemishes. That's just the way I am. That is the way we are, but God wants us to have that attitude that that's not the way we are to be. We do need to change. When God brings out our faults and flaws to our attention, you know, it can be scary. We can see things, maybe only small things, but they still are scary because they are sins. They are contrary to God's way. They're contrary to his law. It may be just the way we look at certain things. We, we might not truly understand everything at this point in time. We forget what we see too easily, and we overlook it. But James, as we read, reminds us that when we do what God commands, we will be blessed. God will help us. God is always there for us. I'll read James 1.25 again. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty... That's God's word. And continues in it. Continues to move forward. Continues to study. He is not a forgetful hearer. But a doer of the work. There's action there. We don't just read the words and then do nothing with it. We don't just come to Sabbath services. And then go home the rest of the week. and It's just the rest of the week until next Sabbath. We take what we hear and what we learn in God's word, at services, in our prayer with our Father, we take all of that and we inculcate it into our lives. It becomes part of us. It's just not the way we act. It's who we are. It's who we are to become. You know, we all have things that we need to change. And all things, we have things that we want to change. You know, there's all kind of books out there to, for self-help books and everything else to, to, to help people change. We have the best self-help book ever written right here. God's Word. But when we compare our daily lives to what we read in here, they always don't mesh together. Hopefully... At any one point in time, we're, we're getting better at it. We don't have the same issues that we had last year or five years ago. But we still have imperfections. We still have flaws. And we need to continue to work on those with God's help. Do we love people, truly love people, by the definition of love that we read in God's word all the time? 
or do we lash out, like Mr. Long was talking about, even you know, for a brief moment, does that, that feeling, that attitude take over and we lash out? We, we need to keep that in, in control and God's spirit within us could do that. You know, there's the Bible talks about transforming and transformation many places. As I said, we need not only to behave like Christians, but we need to become Christ-like. We need to have the spirit of Christ living within us. It needs to become one with our spirit. Because as we, if we, if we just act out or act like we think people want us to act and we we act good we're going to fail at times because we're not always going to be able to do that but as we let god's spirit grow within us god will never fail we will have that attitude we will be able to conquer that the dictionary, Merriam-Webster's dictionary, defines transformation. A complete or major change of someone or something's appearance or its form. People use the word transformation to talk about remodeling of a house or when someone gets a makeover, plastic surgery, what, whatever the house or person undergoes a major change and ends up looking different. And it's easy for that to creep into our thought process, that that's all it is. It's just kind of a, an outward change. And that's all it is. It's just the way something appears. Well, we're to be more than appearing. We're, we're to be Christ-like in our core, our spirit, is to be one with Christ's spirit living within us. That's what the Bible teaches us. Those are the words that we read. And God knows that we can't do that on our own. We can't live up to that standard by ourselves. How can we live a life that reflects God in every aspect, which is what we're being asked to do? God's way is to give us his spirit and for us to undergo what I'll term as an organic change, a change to our core by his spirit operating with our spirit. We are to be transformed. If you turn with me to 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 3, Second Corinthians three, and verse eighteen. We read, but we all with unveiled face, beholding and reflecting like a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as from the Lord's Spirit. That verse doesn't say that we are being transformed by improving our behavior, or by just improving our behavior. Here, being transformed is connected to us beholding the glory of the Lord. Now, many in the world around us take that to mean beholding the glory of the Lord, that there's some vision that we get of this bright being or, or, or something like that. That's not what we're talking about here. Beholding the glory of the Lord. How do we behold the glory of the Lord? Well, if we look at the verse before that, in verse 17, it says the Lord is the Spirit. 
so we can behold him in spirit by conversing with him in prayer and studying the Bible. As we behold the Lord, as we study and pray, we are infused with his spirit, his character. This infusing results in us being transformed organically, or I guess another term is metabolically. It's a big term, but I think we've all heard that. We may not all know what that exactly means, but I'll try to explain it, at least the way I understand it. God's way is changing us by an inward process, a spiritual process, a metabolic process, as I said, of his spirit living in us and acting with our spirit, the spirit in man. Physical metabolism is the process that maintains the life of an organism, all living organisms. Through metabolism, our, the organism lives, grows, and develops. Lifeless things like rocks don't undergo metabolism. We, God's children, aren't lifeless, obviously. We receive God's Holy Spirit in our spirit when we were baptized. God wants his life to spread in us from that time of baptism every moment of our lives. He wants it to, to grow, and we should want it to grow so that we can be a perfect reflection of him. Our spirit being one with his spirit, the Holy Spirit. That's how we become inwardly transformed. And that's how we can be a direct reflection, a perfect reflection of God outwardly to those around us. As I said, this metabolism is a good picture of how we are being changed. Physical metabolism consists of two actions, the breaking down and discharging of old elements and the building up of new ones. That's exactly what we're doing in our lives. It's exactly what we just celebrated during the Passover, is that we are looking into our lives, inspecting our lives with that mirror, and we're finding our flaws. And with God's Holy Spirit, we are throwing out those old pieces, the old man. We're removing that piece by piece. As slow and as painful as the process may seem at times, we're, we keep doing it. And then we replace it with God's Holy Spirit. We become more and more like God. As I said, beholding the Lord is reading his word, reading the Bible, studying it, praying, conversing with God, telling him our problems. He wants to hear from us, and we need to hear from him. You know, there's a, another good illustration of this, this whole process and of God's word, and that's a caterpillar. At birth, a caterpillar has the life that will change, well, has the potential of becoming a butterfly. It doesn't just put on a butterfly costume when it's in the cocoon or try to act like a butterfly. What, is, what does it do? What does the caterpillar do? The caterpillar pretty much does one and only one thing during that time of its life, it eats. As it eats the, the needed nutrients, it grows. And when it makes that cocoon where it remains, little by little, it changes and its body are changed. Organically, they're changed. Eventually, the caterpillar emerges as a butterfly. That dramatic change from being some 
small worm-like creature into a graceful, beautiful butterfly is the result of an organic metabolic process. We began on the spiritual realm, we began the same process when we were baptized. We received the life of God, his Holy Spirit, which is in the pros prospect of, in the, it, it's in the uh, process of transforming us. And think of us in the cocoon at this stage. We're being changed. What do we need to do? Just like the caterpillar, we need to eat. We need to eat spiritual food so we can grow and so we can develop. As we grow, we will gradually change. But we will change inwardly before that change will be expressed outwardly. And no matter how old we are physically, we never reach a point where we no longer need to eat if we want to remain alive. And the same is true about us spiritually. We can never, never get enough of God's food from God's word in our relationship with God, our prayer life. God wants us to take in his Holy Spirit as our real food and drink. We read about that in John 6, 35. You don't have to turn there. I'll, I'll read it. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall by no means hunger, and he who believes in me shall by no means thirst. God is giving us that spiritual nourishment in his word, and we need to take it in every day. We need to truly study. As I said, not just reading the words, but truly studying the words and digging deep and finding out how we can apply those in our lives so that we continue our transformation. And what are we being transformed into? Well, back to 2 Corinthians 3.18, we read that we're being transformed into the same image. We also read in Romans 8, 29, to be transformed into the same image is to be conformed to the resurrected and glorified Christ to be made the same as he is. When we read the four Gospels, we can see the life of Jesus Christ as a man on the earth. It was a life without any defects, any failures, or any imperfections of any kind. His behavior, his attitude, and his care for people are so wonderful. It's the ultimate example that we can look to. He's the only man who has ever lived a life that fully expressed, that ever reflected the true image of God. Father. And as, as I said, Jesus is to be living in us and through us by his spirit. As we pray, pray and study the word, beholding him in our spirit, he infuses us with his Holy Spirit so that we conform to his image. We become more and more like him every day. You know, this transformation that I'm talking about, that we're studying, far exceeds any goal that we might have to improve ourselves or to live the way we think we should. Sure, we need to improve ourselves. We need to live good lives. We need to do the right thing, but it needs to become more than just that. It needs to become who we really are, not who we act like. I'll call it that. Not to mean that we're necessarily doing it purposely, 
but we don't fully comprehend at this point in, until we're shown that by the word of God exactly to what depths he's talking about change within us. He wants us to do more than just change outwardly. He wants us to change completely. Now, as we look around us, we're, as I said, we're not perfect. And what we see, our vision, what we see in the mirror is clouded by smudges. The thing to remember is those smudges, they're not on the mirror. They're not part of the word of God. Those smudges are on our eyes, our spiritual eyes. They're in our hearts. They're the sins that we still hold within us. And the only way that we can remove that and get clearer vision is by removing those sins one by one, one smudge after the next smudge. And if they reappear, we need to wipe them off again. As I said, praying and studying is the way that we need to nourish ourselves. And a person who doesn't eat can't grow. Eventually they will die. The same is true of us. If we don't eat, if we don't pray and we don't study, we will die. Not physically, but spiritually. So, as I said, transformation is not only brought about by improving our behavior. It's certainly an important thing to do. We, we do have to act in those situations. We do have to act the right way. We do have to act as God would want us to do. But we have to act in such a fashion that it's just the way we live. That's just who we are. And, and we're, we're all trying to do that. We, we just need to get better at it. God understands that. He's there supporting us every day. We need to pray for God to show us those areas of our lives that he can help us in. He knows them ahead of time. He sees our flaws. We see our flaws too, many times. Not necessarily all of them. But he wants to help us. We need to ask for his help. He will definitely show us. And not only will he show us, how to improve, how to act better, but he will show us how to make it a core part of our lives, the way we are. You know, there's that old adage about, uh, you know, you can give a man a fish or you can teach him to fish. I don't remember exactly all the words, but one is the short-term solution, the other one is the long-term solution. God is looking at the long-term solution. He wants us to become part of his family, to be like he is. And we must remain vigilant to never allow ourselves to not hold up this mirror, the word of God, such that it does not reflect God. We can't take it lightly. As I said, we can't just read the words and not really take them into our hearts. Only by truly studying his word do we hold the mirror in that right attitude such that it reflects the light. And the only source of light is God himself. You know, the value of a mirror is not in itself I mean, it, it really doesn't bring anything to it. It's in, it, it's in its use. It, its potential is that, that it can be used by someone to inspect themselves. The value of our Bible, it's paper, it's in plastic. 
probably some thread, a few other things. Uh, that's not the value. We all know that. The value is that this is God's word. And God says, study my word, and we can do it. Together, we, we, we can be transformed. We can become one with him. Now, I'd like to kind of switch gears here. And I'd like to look at one example, and only one example, in the Bible of a man who lived a life that exemplifies this process of transformation. And it may not be readily apparent, but as we, we study it today and we looked at some of the key lessons from this man's life, and as we go home and we study more this book of the Bible and study more about this man, I think it will become more and more apparent how important it is for us to inculcate these, the way of God, the laws of God, and write them on our hearts, write them in our inner being, so that when we act as mirrors, we are reflecting God's light. We are reflecting God's image, not our own images, but God's image to those around us. And if you haven't guessed yet, I'm going to ask you to turn to the book of Daniel. And I'll say that at least in my mind, Daniel reflected the light of God in a dark, dark world. And that, by this example, he shows that we can do the exact same thing today in our lives. So before we actually, now that I got you turned to the book of Daniel, you can put a bookmark there. Uh, and maybe you don't even have to turn there. I can, I can just read this because this is a verse that we all know. That's Matthew 5, 14 through 16. And there we read, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. In verse 15, nor do men light a lamp and put it under the grain measure, but on a lampstand and it gives light to all who are in the house. And in verse 16, it says, let your light so shine. This is the verse I want to concentrate on the rest of the, the uh, sermon today. Is It all focuses and, and, and revolves around this, this verse. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Daniel looked in that mirror often. Daniel didn't, didn't have the Bible as, as we know it. But he had, the, he had teachings. He, he had the knowledge of God's laws at that point in time. And he certainly reflected those to those around him. Well, we can't be certain, but most scholars say that Daniel was in his early teen years, probably 13 or 14 years old, when he was drug away to Babylon. He was ripped away from his family, his city that he lived in, his friends, his way of life, to a place totally foreign to him a place where he didn't fit in. And worse than that, it was totally pagan. 
Outwardly, Daniel's God was nowhere to be seen. It's quite overwhelming for a young boy of that age. Imagine yourself. I don't know if we can imagine that. I don't, I, I don't know where we could be taken that we were so isolated as, as Daniel was at that point in his life. And so now let's go back to Daniel 1. And here we begin to read the, the story that the, this king of Babylon, and I've heard all kind of pr pr ways to pronounce this king's name, and uh, bear with me because this is the way I, I pronounce it, is Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king on the earth at the time of Daniel, wanted to influence Daniel and his friends, the other young captives, in order to conquer the Israelites without a prolonged fight. I don't know if we always look at it that way, but you say, well, why didn't they just go in there and kill them all? Well, that wasn't, that wasn't uh, their goal. The king wanted to take the young people, the young Israelites, the now, Daniel, we believe, was part of the, the, the royalty in Jerusalem. So he wasn't necessarily your average Joe on the street. But he was a young, a, young, a young boy. And the king wanted to make these captives think like Babylonians. He wanted them to lose their identity of being Israelites. He wanted to isolate them, and he, kind of, he did that by taking them captive. He wanted to indoctrinate them into the laws and the customs of Babylon. And he wanted to confuse them. Does that sound familiar? Those are some of the same tactics that Satan tries with us. He tries to isolate us. He tries to get us to not fellowship with, with our congregation, with other people of like minds. He tries to get us to not always come to church. He tries to get us to just be off on our own. So we heard about to deal with people. It's not just the people, it, it, our fellow brothers and sisters here. It's dealing with people in the world. Sure, it would be a lot easier just to go off. At least we think it would be a lot easier just to go off and isolate ourselves. One of the gentlemen in Spokesman's Club talked about it, about how at times it would just be so easy to isolate themselves and not deal with people in general. This is exactly what the king, Nebuchadnezzar, was trying to do with Daniel and the other young captives. The point that I want to make is that the way we think about God, ourselves, and others and the world in general determines how we live, determines how we act. You know, if Nebuchadnezzar could get Daniel and his friends to think like Babylonians, they would live like Babylonians. And the reverse was also true that the less they thought of themselves as God's people and as God's servants, the last they would live like one. And how true is that of us? It's easy to forget sometimes who we serve, whose people we are. Satan makes it all, all too easy. As I said, he uses these same tactics on us on a daily basis, more than a daily basis, Minute by minute, at times it seems, Satan's in there jabbing and stirring the pot, giving us attitudes 
about things that if we step back and we, we look at it with God's vision of it, have absolutely no meaning whatsoever, are not important. So, we could go through and read the, the whole book of Daniel, and we don't have time for that, and I wouldn't even propose that we would even do that. You can do that on your own, but I'd like to point out at least four areas, four lessons from the life of Daniel that I think reflect this process of transformation and this process of being a mirror and reflecting God's image to those around us. And the first one was that we read about in, in chapter one, and we're all, we're all familiar with all these stories, but just briefly, it's, it's where they were, they were brought and they were to study. And one of the things that the king wanted to do was to have them eat the king's food and drink the king's wine. He's trying to entice them with the good things of the of the Babylonian world. Here you don't have to eat this you know lowly food that everybody else is getting. You can you can eat the, the, the food that we have. Yet the food was against the the law. It was unclean food to Daniel. It it may have been sacrificed to idols, but we don't know all the reasons and all, all, all the characteristics of that food, but we knew, do know that Daniel purposed, as it said, in his heart to not eat it. And why did he say? Because he didn't want to defile himself. Daniel was far from home, he didn't have to uphold his stand, the Jewish standards that he was brought up with, what he had learned. Well, his parents weren't there. There was very few people that he actually knew, probably knew from back home. He could have eaten that food without even thinking about it. But he didn't. He didn't because he was brought up in such a way and had learned the precepts of God. He was learned to be have integrity, to do what he said, and to always do that, and not to be wishy-washy. It was instilled in him from a young age. What mattered to Daniel was pleasing God. Not anything else, utmost was pleasing God. According to what we read, Daniel and his three friends were the only one that refused the king's food. All the others, it seems, they ate the food, whatever the king offered. It's an important lesson for us. You know, peer pressure for all of us. It's easy to think of peer pressure as you know ch children in school or uh, various things, but we all have peer pressure. We, we we all come in contact with friends and relatives and just people in general, and we're influenced by them. But just like Daniel, he wasn't willing to compromise. He wasn't willing to smudge the mirror, such that people didn't have a true vision of the God he served. You know, if you're wishy-washy about things, you know, I've heard stories going back through time of people that would work uh, on the Sabbath, just one time, a special situation. And then, you know, the boss would come to them after that and expect them, oh, you, you worked that one time, why can't you start working every, every week? That was, that's a compromise. 
you know, it's not necessarily the ox in the ditch, as we read about. It's, it's truly a compromise. Daniel wasn't willing to do that. He stuck to his guns. He had purposed in his heart. Deep within his core, he knew the right thing to do, and he followed through on it. It's an important question for each one of us to ask. What are the non-negotiable aspects of each one of our lives? What things are we not willing to compromise on? A second lesson I think that we could draw from the life of Daniel in reflecting God's image is Daniel determined a wise approach to the immediate dilemma. If you turn to uh, Daniel 1 in verse 9, how did he uh, resolve or propose to resolve this, this whole idea of turning down the king's food? Well, in, in verse 9 it says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should you should see he your faces worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall you make me endanger my head to the king. Well then in verse 11, so this prince of the eunuchs, who God had given Daniel favor with, said, no, no, you can't, I'm going to lose, you know, I'm going to, the king's going to kill me if I, if I let you do this. It's not going to work. Daniel didn't immediately give up. Daniel didn't say, oh, I better eat, I better eat it. I, I, you know, I don't want to get this guy mad at me and, you know, all the rest of it. No, he didn't. He thought God helped him. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel. So this Melzar was a subordinate to the, to the prince of the eunuchs. He was the next man in charge. He was actually the man directly over Daniel. And Daniel approached him. He had a proposal. You know, let us, let us eat the vegetables. Let, let us do this for a period of time. And if, if it doesn't work, you know, if, it's, if we're not looking better, after the 10 days or, or whatever, then, then we, we can talk again. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Yeah, I, I'm sure if we think back, we, we've all been through that situation. And we may not have always reacted that way. I know I've been in situations like that, and I, I didn't react the way I probably should have because it didn't work out in the end. If I would have acted a little differently, it would, have, it would have worked out better. Hopefully I've gotten better at that. I think I have. Not because of me, but because of God working in me. But Daniel is a good example of this. We can't become flustered when a little hardship comes along and seems to disrupt our lives. Think of Daniel about being life disrupted. He was drug out of Israel. I mean, he, he was separated from everything he knew. His whole life had changed. I don't think any of us had gone through that to, to that extent. I'm sure we've had our own times where, when life seemed difficult. But Daniel didn't compromise. He didn't change what he knew and what he had learned to write on his heart. He looked to God for solutions, and God helped him with the solutions. Another lesson, and I think this is maybe one of the most important lessons, they're all important, but Daniel used his influence. As we read through the book of Daniel, and also read the story of Joseph, you know, 
they didn't compromise, either one of them. Daniel here in Babylon, Joseph in Egypt. But look where it, they ended up. It wasn't like they were banished to a corner somewhere. You know, this, this, this weird guy, he, you, know, we, we, you know, we don't know what we're going to do with it. No. They were put in charge of things. They were elevated in earthly roles. But they didn't compromise. They reflected God's image truly, as perfectly as they were able at the time. Was it perfect? No. None of us are perfect until that final change comes. None of us. But they reflected God in their lives. People knew that they were different. You know, we, we, we've heard that story about, oh, when we go to the feast, you know, we've heard the story about, oh, yeah, you're, you're, it's, it, it's great. You know, you people are wonderful. It's just that crazy religion you have, you know? It's like, well, okay. So just kind of take a deep breath and move forward. You know, that, that's exactly why we're different, or should be exactly why we're different. Because we've, we're reflecting God's image. We're not reflecting our own image. Our image is becoming more and more like the image of God every day. So Daniel used his influence. And I'll say, we each have the ability to use our influence. You know, we're influenced by so many people every day. We come in contact with so, so many people. You know, the waiter in a restaurant, uh, the, the, the people driving down the road with us. Uh, you name it. We, we come in, our, our friends, our, our family. We have the ability of influence them. And, and, I, and I'm not talking about preaching to them. I will say that preaching to them is probably not the best way to reflect God's image. It's important for us to live God's way in our hearts. And as I said earlier, not just act good, but to truly reflect God's image from our hearts. You know, it's we influence people, we influence new people that come to church with us. And we can influence the, the people, staff in the building, uh, the landscapers that we saw outside today. We can influence all of those people simply by the way we act. Do we try to be, as Mr. Long was talking about, do, do we lash out with, with wrath? Or do we have a kind word? Do we shake the hand at the, the driver that cuts us off? Guilty as charged. Getting better at it, but still guilty as charged. You know, Daniel, we read in verse 47, chapter 2, it says, Truly your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings. Nebuchadnezzar saw God reflected in the way Daniel presented himself. And then in chapter 6, in verses 25 through 27, this is after the Daniel was thrown into the den of lions, we see another king, King Darius, and he decrees that no one should worship anyone but the God of Daniel. Were these two kings converted on the spot? Did they truly, truly understand that God was, Daniel's God was the one true God? No, probably not. But one day, God will open their eyes. And Daniel's influence will remain in their minds. They'll remember Daniel, but really not Daniel. They'll remember God's reflection through Daniel. 
And that's how we are all supposed to be. People should see us as different. And we should try and pray and study so that we reflect God's image perfectly. That we never, never reflect an image that it is not of God. As we develop and transform through God's Holy Spirit, as we live what we learn and study, we'll never lack an opportunity to influence those around us by reflecting God's Spirit through our use of God's Word and what we've learned by studying it. Now, there's no example in Scripture of a government becoming godly and changing the world. But there are examples of individuals who, by reflecting the one true, wonderful God that we serve, changed a part of the world. And more than that, the potential is there that in the future, those that we influence or affect by our way we, way we deal with them, the way we have kind words for them, the way we help them, the way we truly reflect God, they, when that time comes, that, that reflection of God's image will be perfect and that we and they may fulfill the scripture, and that's in Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Once again, who do you see in the mirror? Who do others see?